So, so far, so good. Jesus has helped us in this series that we have advanced from definition of terms to the practicality of what it is that Jesus is trying to show us in these teachings. Remember, I have taught you many times that the goal of a teaching is not to fill your head with knowledge. The goal of a teaching is to enhance your Christian life. So a teaching is not complete until people have been able to apply what it is that they have been taught. So the end game or the end goal of a teaching is practice. So if you just fill up your notes, fill up your head, and you do not apply the things that you have been taught, it means that the teacher has not succeeded in their enterprise. This is why, if, you are a, if you've been in the regular educational system, once they finish teaching a topic, what a good teacher does after teaching a topic is that they will give you homework. If you're in elementary school, it's called homework. When you advance up the ladder in education, you will find that in your textbooks, you will have things they call practice questions. The whole idea of the practice questions is now that you have been introduced to a new topic, you have to apply yourself to the knowledge that you have been exposed to. So if in the first three parts you have not begun to personally apply your heart to the things that you have been exposed to, then you have not done yourself justice. You have wasted the resources that God has made available to us in this season. The end game of a Bible teaching is that by the time we look at you over time, we see the effect of those teachings on your daily practical Christian work. If you are not applying the things that have been taught to you, it's one of two things. It's either, number one, you do not believe that the things that have been taught to you are the truth. If you have embraced it in your heart as the truth of God's word, then you will do everything within your power to apply it to your life. So you attend a teaching on prayer, like we have been doing for the past four or five weeks. We have been talking about priesthood on Wednesdays, exposing us to the doctrine and the practice of priesthood. I expect that by now, people would have begun to apply it to their lives, They've attended teachings on prayer. The proof that you attended the teaching is not the statistic that your name is in attendance. The proof that you attended the teaching is that it has shifted your Christian experience. Your Christian experience has improved. You have grown in your work with God as a consequence of that teaching. So since we began talking about discipleship, I expect that by now, Everybody should know that Mathetes is the core of the Christian experience. God's burden is discipleship. The heart cry of Jesus is disciples. So if you've been associated with the Christian space and you have not grown into discipleship, it means that all of the resources that God has made available to you for the number of years that you have been born again have been wasted. God's burden is to make you a disciple. I have shown you in these three parts that if you read through the Bible, you will find out that before they became apostles, they were first what? Disciples. It was out of the pool of disciples that apostles were ordained. And I also showed you that if they were going to continue as apostles, they needed to remain disciples. So your apostleship was not a license for you to disconnect yourself from your disciplines. In fact, in becoming an apostle, the weight of expectation in engaging your disciplines becomes higher. For the Bible says that those who bear the responsibility of teaching, they should be aware that judgment is going to begin from the Lord's house. How? First. 
So to him whom much is given, much is expected. If God has so privileged you to stand in the places of ordinations and the places of leadership, it means that your own dealings before God is going to be sterner, is going to be stiffer, is going to be deeper. This is why me, I don't understand why young men and young women are in a hurry to become pastors. I don't understand the craving, the craving to, to bear a title. Somebody has the grace to get one word of knowledge correctly, he now puts the appellation prophet in front of his name. People are in a hurry to bear titles. They do not know that the closer you are to levels of authority, the sterner and stiffer your judgment. There are things that you could, other people in the congregation can play with and God will, will, will handle them with, with some kind of liberty. But you that, that wears a collar, you that stands in the pulpit, you that bears the title of an apostle, an evangelist, a prophet, a teacher, a pastor, your own, your own punishment will be stiffer. Have you ever wondered why David and Saul engaged in the same disobedience with God? But God made sure that David's punishment, he made sure that his disgrace was in public glare. Have you thought about it? He said, that thing that you did in secret, your son will do it to you in public. David ran from the palace like a common thief. The king of Israel. He ran. One mistake, he looked upon a woman that was naked. His heart could not bring his appetite under control. If you were here when we started praying, and you, you follow the prayers that Brother Ralph led. If you prayed those prayers, you are, you are privileged. What a great blessing. Because me in my room where I was following this, those prayers, I saw heaven open. Great realities were released during that prayer session. So if you missed it and you are in service tonight, when the meeting finishes, go back and clock that one hour, 15 minutes. It will bless you. Because if you were here, you will notice that he... He, as he was about to close his prayer session, he began to lead us on the prayer session that revolves around the war of appetite. It's the greatest battle that a generation is fighting, is appetite. Appetite. When you meet a young man that says he fell into fornication, the thing that led him into fornication, many people have experienced that same test, but they didn't fall. Why is it that you, you fell? That's the question we should ask you, you. Because the Jesus he met, the one that survived the temptation, hmm? the Jesus he met is the same one you met. How come when he left that encounter, he left strengthened in his appetite? Your own appetite is still weak. How come men are surviving it? Me and my wife were talking last night when I just came in from Bayelsa, and we're talking about one of my daughters in this house that her growing up sexually abused, her growing up all kinds of accusations. Today, she's married to a good man, raising her children. She didn't say because I never knew my father, I never knew my mother, I never knew anything. So she now went to do Igbiraja. Sorry, sorry. Online people. Uh, Igbiraja is... Uh, is urobo for prostitution. I know the word is heavy. Igbiraja. <laughs> is for prostitution. She didn't end up as a prostitute. And there are many people who, when you meet them today, you ask them, why is your life like this? Uh, my, I didn't have father. But there are other people who had the same experiences that you have. Met the same Jesus that you claim to have met but they turned out different. You know what? They were able to win the war of appetite. Of appetite. And I'm trying to say to you tonight that the reason many people are winning and others are losing is that they, 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 they embrace teaching. They enjoy the teaching. But they are unwilling to pay the price to make the teaching a part of their Christian experience. 
taking a teaching out of your notebook, taking knowledge out of your head, and applying it to your life will cost you many things. It's a discipline that cannot be imparted. It's a discipline that you yourself tell yourself. You will call yourself to a meeting and you will say, enough of just attending church and listening to teachings. I want to apply this thing to my life. Once you have made up your mind in that regard, then you will now begin to notice. Because God deals with us on the basis of sincerity. When God sees that you are sincere, you are ready now. He will now begin to show you things in your life that you must divorce. That if you are going to do this thing, this one must go. This, this one, it must go. Then this one, it must go. Your, the proof that your heart is sincere is that when God puts his finger on something, immediately you say, it goes. The fact that you are still struggling to obey, God has told you, that relationship, end it. You are still saying, I don't know how the sister will feel. Oh, is a sign that the things that you claim you want in God, your life is a lie. You know what I call those kind of people? They are frauds. It's easy to sing in church, Lord, I love you. I love you. I will die for you. I want you now. Then when God comes in the night to say, okay, this thing that you want, I want to give you, but see what is going to cost you. The proof that your desire is authentic is in your willingness to pay the price to realize it. That's the proof that your desire is authentic. If all you have is, is desire, and then every time you are saying, I'm too weak, I'm too tired, I'm too, I'm too, I'm too not knowledgeable, I don't know why it's only me, it, the, the desire is not yet authentic. If it is authentic, there's a way it will begin to drive you to pay certain prices to move from desire to reality. I'm telling you that that thing cannot be imparted. It will cost you. And this is why we do a lot of repetition when we teach. Because as a teacher myself, you know that I'm a teacher, I lecture. As a teacher myself, I find out that repetition is very, very powerful. Repetition is one of the ways people learn. If you don't repeat certain things, it will not be ingrained into people's memory. That is why every time I come to start a part, I will first of all take you back to the things we have learned. And sometimes when I take you back like that, there are things that God wanted me to say last week that I didn't say. He will now bring it. I will now say it. And sometimes I may not even get into the teaching for the current Sunday. I now have to move it to another week. Because it is the Holy Ghost that does the teaching. It's not the man. I have found out that it's not, it's, not, it's not enough to have something to say as a preacher. In fact, if you are a student of the Bible, if you read your Bible consistently, you will have something to say. But it's not about having something to say. The thing about a Bible study is what is the Spirit saying? Are you with me? So these things I'm telling you now, I didn't sit down in my study today and say, when I get to service... I will start like this. Then when I start like this, when I get here, then I'll not do like this. <laughs> That's not how we prepare for Bible study. As I prepare for Bible study, I will speak in tongues, then a scripture will drop. Then I will write it. Then I will continue praying. That's how we prepare for Bible study. So I don't even know how to enter into my teaching now, so you better be praying for me. <laughs> Praise God. So if you've been around long enough, we've, be, we've, be, we've been able to define this word mathetes. This is the Greek for the word the disciple. And if you've been around long enough, I've told you that um, the word disciple is used most frequently in the New Testament, even more than the word Christian. I told you that if you study your Bible carefully, those of you that have been doing the assignment I gave you at the beginning of the year, that you have been reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see the word disciple repeated over and over and over. In fact, uh, Bible scholars tell us that the word disciple is used about 257 times, and the word Christian is used only three times in the entire Bible. In fact, today as I was studying, I found out that even in the book of Isaiah, the word disciple is used once in the Old Testament. 
in the book of Isaiah. But that's not my teaching. I also said to us that who you call a disciple needs to meet three critical criteria. One, he must be a learner. So a disciple is a learner. Perpetual learner. Two, I said he is a student. Three, I said he is a follower. That's what the word mathetes means. What we translate in, in English to mean disciple, actually in the Greek, it is broken down into these three things. He is a learner, he is a student, he is a follower. Now, if you have followed the teaching carefully, you would have noticed also that I have shown you that the disciples' relationship with Jesus is also in these three phases. So, as a learner, Jesus is the disciples' mentor. And when we are speaking about learner, we are speaking about the apprenticeship system. So, the disciple is Jesus' what? Apprentice. And you know the thing about apprenticeship? Apprenticeship is, is deeper than just regular education. Because in apprenticeship, a master learn, a master, um, a, 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 what would I call it now? Who you call somebody? What do you call somebody that is a master? A, a, the word is floating in my spirit. Well, okay. Somebody that has mastered a skill. Hmm? An expert. That's it. An expert is teaching a learner the basic skills practically about how to become an expert. So in apprenticeship, the emphasis is on practicals. So the, 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 the apprentice learns by observation and by doing. He doesn't just observe. 